knife nerds and knife nuts and other people that like budget knives and everyone else, how are you doing? It's October. It's getting cold out. Uh, if you're a fan of my Instagram posting, you saw that outside everything's yellow here. We don't get a lot of colors. It's just... Anyhow, I had a great weekend uh, with my grandkids and uh, my children and such. It's time to get back at the knives. This is a San Remu knife, and I've been a huge fan of San Remu knives. I've reviewed over a hundred of them on my channel since I started in 2016. This is another one. This one's been around for like for eight, nine months already. You know, it took me a while to get it. That's just how it goes sometimes. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a Japanese sword turned into a pocket folder made by a Chinese company. Are there things wrong with it? Yeah, maybe. Are there things good with it? Oh yeah. Do you want to hear everything? Well, stick around. I'm going to try to give you all the details. I haven't decided if I'm going to do a full teardown or not. I did do a teardown on this, well, a, a re-repair. I'm getting all my knives from the United States. Well, most of my knives from the United States. You can buy this in Canada. I'll give you all the links to purchase it down below. I got mine through White Mountain Knives, where you can save 10% with coupon code CCE. Uh, what I was talking about, though, is the teardown. These kind of ambilock or axis lock knives can be very tricky to reassemble. Sometimes, depending on how they make them, they're easier than other times. What else do you want to know about this knife? I think you want to know everything, so let's get to the tabletop and get started. Hey guys, I got an announcement I got to make too. It's the beginning of the next month and I did the random draw using Google number generator to choose a number. I've got 40, 48 supporters this month, this past month. So that's either on Patreon or YouTube members. One of my supporters wins a knife every month and the random number came up to a guy named Mike. Mike W from Austria. Isn't that cool bandit? Austria. So I sent you an email, Mike, and a message on Patreon. You can choose one of the knives that I reviewed last month as your prize. So uh, respond to that email, and uh, we'll figure out exactly which one it is that you want. Yes, good boy, Bandit. Good boy. Now on to the review. I'm using this gray background just to make things a little easier to see uh, over the blue background that I usually have. Let's start this thing off with a size comparison with the Ontario Rat 1 right here. Line up those pivot pins a bit. Yeah, it's pretty close to the same size. It's just a tiny bit shorter than a Rat 1, which makes it, you know, a full-size knife. What do we have? Well, we've got not really an upswept blade, although they've made it look a bit like an upswept blade. It comes up a tiny bit, but that's just because it comes down a tiny bit. But uh, yeah, I'm basically going to call that a straight back blade. Got a swedge that starts right after that thumb disc and comes almost to the tip. So it actually does have a fairly strong tip. It's thick at the tip, actually, so it's pretty durable that way. We've got a belly here and then a long straight section. We've got a flat grind, kind of like a saber grind that comes up there. It does not have a you know, typical Japanese Tanto tip, you know, where it's got a separate grind at the tip edge. Like I said, it's D2 steel. On the badging, it says D2 right there. And then we've got the SRM triangle, 9215. And then we've got the serial number. This one's number 10. The badging, at least it's up on the flat. At least it's not huge. It's a little bigger than it needs to be, but there it is. And on this side, again, we've got SRM. So we've got SRM on that side, SRM on this side, and then we got another SRM there, over badging, right? And that's, I've always said that on these knives, they put their SRM logo on it three times, which is two times too many in my opinion. They're saying SRM stands for stay ready for more. That's the badge. The thumb disc, it's got a T6 head on that thumb disc. I believe it's all one piece, that whole thumb disc. So you could screw it out. If you don't like that thumb disc, you can get rid of it. And you can just actuate the knife using, you know, the access lock. You can, you know, flip the knife open and flip it closed. If it works quite right, it's not terribly smooth. The action on this thing needs a break-in period. I don't remember for certain. I think it's got washers and because uh, it doesn't feel like it's got ball bearings. I believe it's got washers in there. Maybe I'll do a teardown to see. I just hate doing teardowns because putting it back together is a pain. 
So I'll probably record that last. What's good on this blade? Well, it's thin behind the grind, so it cuts and slices fairly well. It's not a great piercing kind of knife. You know, it does have that edge, you know, coming up quite a little bit of a bluntish kind of nose, not really, but a little bit. And you have no guard. You've got a little bit of jimping right there. Nothing on the back. You just have that thumb disc and that little bit of jimping. You know, if you plunge this into something and you come to an abrupt stop, uh, your hand might slide over that edge. So it's not really a stabbing knife. What else do we have? Well, here, where most knives have a sharpener's choil, since it's an axis lock knife, you know, they've got a whole cutaway section in there because the lock bar goes and sits in that spot to hold it closed. They brought that cutaway past the plunge. They've done a really good job because you've got maybe two millimeters, a sixteenth and a half of an inch space between the end of the plunge and when the heel starts. So you can sharpen right to the end here and not mess up grinding into the plunge. So that's a good thing. I'm happy with that. The handle, well, we've got sort of, you know, this wrapped look. It's G10 and uh, of course, it's blue G10 with one layer of black G10 on top, and then they mill out these diamond shapes to look like a wrap. And, you know, of course, they do it on both sides. There's the pivot right there. It should be a D-shaped screw. I believe it is. T8 screw on this side, but it's a button screw set into G10, which I think is kind of ugly because you can even see it on this one. See these white spots? There's junk already collecting in that little space there. You know, because the button screws a button and then, you know, the G10 comes up and goes across. It creates a little corner there, you know, for junk to accumulate. Same thing back here with these T6 screws. You know, there's junk accumulating in these little T6 screws. So we've got T6 inset button screws, which in my opinion is a big eh, failure. I don't like that at all. The screw quality on Sanrei Mew knives has always been sort of okay, not great. On some knives, especially years ago, they used to be pretty soft. They're okay. They're not great. It's just okay. So you got two screws holding that together. We've got exposed liners. There's a little bit of skeletonizing in there. And, you know, at least they put the holes in the liners, you know, with that same diamond shape to help balance it out. Oh, by the way, the balance, it's right there. I would prefer if the balance was over the pivot pin right here where the grip is. It would give it a better hand feel. But yeah, it's okay. Got some jimping back here as well for the grip. And then we've got the backspacer with the exposed lanyard hole back here. I think that's a pretty good thing. I'm happy with that. I don't use lanyards much, but if I do, I like that if it insets so that the paracord doesn't stand out. It's easy to tie it off and bring it out the back, so that's a good thing. And then we've got their pocket clip. Now, I forget what the name is of this pocket clip, but it's a really nice pocket clip. These two pieces come up and you squeeze it together and pull to take the pocket clip out. So it's this one piece steel pocket clip. You've got these teeth here on the edge of it and they grab on and it goes in either side. So if you want to go from right-handed to left-handed, it's that easy and it holds well, it's a good pocket clip. Let's demonstrate it going in a pocket. It climbs over, you know, you've got that flat spot on the top. It's got good retention, you know, it's got good springiness to it. Goes in all the way to the bottom. Yeah, it hides fairly well in a pocket and it holds quite well. So I'm happy with this pocket clip. I'm glad that they've done a good job with that. So that brings us to other things like lockup and such. Well, first off, the alignment. I usually do it this way, pretty much right down the middle. I'm happy with it. It's a little bit closer to this side right now. I do have the pivot screw a little bit loose, and that's so that it will, you know, open and close. I know I'm a little too close to the camera for this shot right to do this, but yeah, it opens and closes just fine. And if you want that much freedom, you're going to have blade play. It's side to side wobble in there. But up and down lockup's quite good. It holds well. It's a good sturdy lock, but you've got a little bit of blade play. If you want to get rid of that blade play, then you tighten up this screw and 
you know, it just, it doesn't go, it just holds on tight. And even now, there's still a little bit of wobble in there, side to side wobble. So you can't have it set up with no side to side blade play. It's just, at least on mine, it's not possible. But if you want to have any fidgetness to it, you have to keep it loose enough uh, so that, uh, you know, you can fidget with it. And uh, what do I think of the thumb stud, the disc, I should say? Well, it's got jimping on the side. Functionally, it works. You know, it works for right or left handed just fine. And I do like that it's not too far forward. You know, it's a little bit forward. Like if you're slicing through things, yeah, you can't really use the last quarter inch of the knife, but you've got lots of blade that you can use. So there's that. Now, I might show you the teardown right now, but I'm going to record it at the end. This is as far as I'm going to take it apart. Uh, I took the uh, pin out. It's a D-shaped pin. We do have some D-shaped pins back here. I'll show you a picture of this without the tape on it. I put the tape on there to hold it together, otherwise it just falls apart. And, you know, I just pushed this through as this was coming out so that I could spread it apart. And I know you can't see in there. Yeah, it's got washers. There's a Teflon washer and a phosphor bronze washer on either side. That gives it a little bit longer break in time. Phosphor bronze washers, you know, that's, you know, the old way of doing things. Uh, for the last five, six years, ball bearings have been in the vast majority of folding knives, certainly budget folding knives. And, you know, they just have the old system in here. Here's the uh, Omni spring, and I took that off. The measurements, the specs and such. Like I said, D2 steel. I think they've made this D2 fairly hard, which is pretty good. It's probably pretty close to around 60 on the Rockwell hardness. And, you know, I don't really like D2 steel on pocket knives. I would much prefer stainless steel on pocket knives. That said, D2 is a decent carbon steel. The weight of this knife, 87 grams, 3.07 ounces. So the weight's not bad. The sharpness from the factory measured at three spots along the blade. An average score of 185 bests. A little bit worse than average, but not terrible. The length of the cutting edge, 90.6 millimeters, 3.57 inches. Blade length, so tip to the closest spot on the handle, 91.6 millimeters, 3.61 inches. The thickness of the blade here up on the flat, three millimeters exactly. That's 0.118 of an inch, so just a tiniest bit under an eighth of an inch. The blade depth at the widest point, 19.9 millimeters, 0.784 of an inch. How thick is it behind the grind? Again, measured in three spots along the blade. The average is 0.48 millimeters, 19 thousandths of an inch. It's pretty good. I wouldn't mind if it was thinner. This knife could stand with a thinner than edge than that, but that's pretty good. The grind angles, they did a better job than average on sharpening. This side's got an average of 20.8 degrees. This side's got an average of 22.3 degrees. On this side, it started at 21.3 here, ended at 23.3, so that's two degrees of change along the length. This side started at 20.2 degrees, ended at 21.5 degrees, that's 1.3 degrees of change along the length. That's better than most. For the kind of use, light use that this knife would be good for, you know, I'd probably do this 18 degrees per side, maybe even a little bit less. The handle length, 120.6 millimeters, 4.75 inches, and that's right to the end of this backspacer. The grip area in here, it's right around 11 centimeters or four and a half inches. It's quite a bit more than most knives have. The thickness of the handle, the surface of the G10 to the surface of the G10, 11.1 millimeters, 0.437 of an inch. The widest or deepest part of the handle is actually right about here. 21.9 millimeters, 0.862 of an inch. When the knife is closed, the widest point is right here on the thumb disc. 26.2 millimeters, 1.03 inches. And the total length of this knife from tip to tail, 211 millimeters, 8.31 inches. Most stores are selling this in the United States for $49.95. Is that a good price for this? Yeah, I think it's okay. 
Uh, White Mountain Knives, of course, you save 10%. That makes this $44.96. So basically 45 US for this knife instead of 50. That's pretty good. That equals about $62 Canadian. In Canada, at Blades Canada, aka Warriors and Wonders, it's $68. So this is one of those knives, one of those instances where the Canadian price is not stupid crazy high compared to the American price. It's actually roughly equivalent to the American price. So if you're in Canada, I would not try to ship this across the border. I would buy it from Blades Canada. If you don't mind the fact that this thing is going to be a pain to do any maintenance on, it's a decent buy. Is this a good knife? If you're not going to want it to be a big, heavy user of yours, you're not going to take it out into, you know, backcountry or anything. You're, what I mean is you're not going to get it all dirty in there so you don't have to clean it. Yeah, it's okay. If you're looking for a hard use knife, no, this is not it, especially because of how it's made. You know, to be honest with you, I don't like most Benchmade knives because of the axis lock. This one's a pain in the butt, to be honest with you, and uh, I don't like it for that. But for urban EDC, if you're going to keep it fairly clean, not bad. If you're one of those who has the skill set to reassemble an axis lock, sure, go for it. Do I like this knife? Would I buy it for myself? Now, you're talking to a guy who's a major fan of Sandra Mew. I really, really like Sandra Mew knives, but I think I would give this knife a pass. It's not super functional. Of course, they did a pretty good job with the parameters that they have, but it's more, you know, on the spectrum of toy to tool, this thing's more on the toy side than it is on the tool side. And I tend to want my knives to be more on the tool side. Now, I do like features that are fun, features that are cool, you know, that push towards the toy side. But at the end of the day, it needs to also be functionally on the tool side, like solidly on the tool side. And this knife just isn't quite there. I like the pocket clip. It's really cool. I introduced it, uh, this pocket clip, on some other knives, you know, a year, almost two years ago already. I'm glad that they're still using it. It's a good functional pocket clip that's easy to take out and put back. It's a full depth and, you know, it's got good retention. It holds well. So that's nice. I like that this knife is not heavy. It's got a cool look to it. I don't mind the thumb disc. And, uh, you know, you decide for yourself if you want to get one. Would it be good enough for me if it had a decent stainless steel, like maybe say 14C28N? It certainly would bring it closer to the side that I want it to be at. Like I said before, D2 is not a bad functioning steel. It, it's a good steel for sharpening it. It holds an edge quite well. And I like it. Um, I don't find it too hard to sharpen, but that's because I use diamond stones for my harder steels. I just don't, like I said, I don't like D2 on pocket knives. One last thing again, the button screws. I just got to say it again. I just don't like inset T6 button screws. Give me T8 screws any day. Even T8 button screws back here would be quite an improvement because T6 screws just strip out too easily. They just can't be trusted. So there you go. That's the opinion coming from Jake at Canadian Cutting Edge. Thank you to my supporters, those of you who help me out every single month for as little as $2 US per month. The perks that you get, I hope you're finding them worth it. And if you're not yet a supporter of the channel, uh, please consider it. And remember, always, everyone, cut towards your chum, not your thumb. And yes, it's healing up very, very well.